Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. <coughs> and today our speaker is uh, Jake Anderson from our building office. He's going to talk about starfish in the Sundance Sea. Yeah. I guess you can read the rest of the title up there. Jay's been with the Bureau for about 10 years, and before that he worked for almost 20 years as a uh, geolo geologist and retrophysicist with the Petroleum Ministry in, in Calgary, and I think Houston. So welcome, uh, Jay Gunderson. How about those starfish? Okay. Thank you, Tom. <coughs> Should I wait for Jeff? Hey, Jeff. Uh, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> Forget that. Okay, um, as Tom said, uh, you can read the title. I'm going to talk today about some starfish, in particular, some starfish fossils that I found in uh, south central Montana that were once covered by the Sundance Sea about 160 million years ago, and kind of the sequence of events that uh, led to the collection of those uh, um, starfish. So it's not a real technical talk. Louder? It's more of a, okay, it's more of a personal story. And uh, as I said, what led to the collection of these fossils. So briefly an outline, I'm gonna give you a taste of the Pryor Mountains simply because I don't know that everybody's been to the Pryors and they're kind of a special place, I think. The geologic setting, a starfish fossil, and behind that a little bit of paleontology, a little bit of biology, my ongoing hobby, and finally some interest, and finally uh, then what did we learn? So the Pryor Mountains are located about 40 miles straight south of Billings in this little square here. They don't get nearly the attention uh, that the neighbors to the west, the Beartooth Mountains get, or to the east, the Bighorn. Uh, so they kind of get ignored, and that's partly why I want to give you a little bit of flavor of the Pryor Mountains. <clears throat> um, high mountains. Uh, just over 9,000 feet high, and there's two main blocks I'll be talking about today. This is the East Pryor block, this is Big Pryor, but also very deep canyons. And this canyon is Devil's Canyon, uh, runs kind of toward the west, which is the direction we're looking, and dumps into Bighorn Canyon, uh, which runs along the east side of the East Pryor block here. And it's a very arid climate, probably one of the more arid climates or areas in Montana. This is the Bighorn Canyon. Uh, you can go by boat some 30, 40 miles between two landings, one to the north and one in the south. So it's really a beautiful place to spend some time. Uh, wild flowers in the alpine meadows. And also, its priors are really well known because they're one of the three places in the United States that have herds of wild horses. Uh, these horses have been linked to the Spanish conquistadors back in about the late 1600s or so. And they're really magnificent if you ever get a chance to get up on top of uh, East Pryor Mountain and, and look at the wild horse herds. There's a lot of caves in the Pryors. This is Big Pryor, or Big Ice Cave on East Pryor Block. And lots of culture. Native, American, uh, Native Americans have occupied the area for some 10,000 years. Petroglyphs, pictographs, and hundreds of teepee rings and artifact sites, things like that. And beautiful exposures. So if you're a geologist, it's a fabulous place to, to look at rocks. This is the Grable Sandstone on the southwest side of the Pryor Mountains. It's a beautiful canyon full of cross-bedded sandstones. They're red and yellow and white, just beautiful. And part of why there's such good exposure is just the arid climate. There's not much vegetation covering things. I'm just showing a little bit here. The, some of the rocks I'll be talking about today that dip off to the right side here. So the older ones are the Ellis Group, and then this is the Morrison Formation in here, uh, Kootenai Formation, and you see uh, Big Pryor Mountain in the background here. So in terms of geology, this is our geologic map from, of the Bridger Quad, mapped by David Lopez. Uh, just to get you oriented, this is Bridger, Montana, Laurels up here somewhere on the freeway. Uh, and this is Highway 310 running down to Lovell, Wyoming, uh, Montana-Wyoming border. And the part I'll be talking about for the Priors, the things you've seen, uh, are the East Prior Block and the Big Prior Block, which are Madison limestone. 
And those are both cut by faults, leaving pretty steep scarps on the east sides of the mountains. They're kind of hinge faults, so they've been uplifted on the east side and the north side. For the geologists in the crowd, this is the Nyboller fault zone. Um, and, er and we've got rocks exposed from all the way from Precambrian along the fault edge here. And as I said, up to the Mississippian limestones and they dip off to the southwest. So as you step off the prior mountains, this big prior block here, you get into the Triassic, Jurassic, into the Cretaceous sediments, all the way out to the tertiary Fort Union if you go as far as Belfry. Uh, Bighorn Canyon is here. So if we look at a cross section across those two blocks, uh, we'll start on the eastern side again, the eastern fault zone, and then this big long dip slope of Madison limestone off to the west. The next fault marking the big prior block and again dipping off toward the southwest and younger and younger horizons as we go to the southwest. <clears throat> uh, I threw this in, and, whoop, in case there are, uh, for non-geologists, and there's also a good view also of the, of the fault blocks, the yellow lines here again are the big faults along the east. We're looking kind of to the west here. Big fault here, big fault here. The two fault blocks again hinge, fault, hinge faulted up. Uh, steep on the east and north sides and dip off to the southwest. Uh, really good exposure of Mattis or Amsden, ten sleep. This orange layer here is the distinctive uh, Triassic chug water layer, somewhat folded along the south margin there. And then into the Jurassic sediments that I'll be talking about today. And then this dark line here is about uh, somewhere in the lower Cretaceous, the Thermopolis Shale is that dark guy. Bighorn Canyon again on the east side. So my story actually begins about 70 million years prior to that, about 150 million years ago, at a time when the Sundance Sea occupied much of the interior of the western United States. Uh, from about this time period, 180 to 155 million years ago, I've got an X there where the prior mountains are. So you see it sits somewhere out in the Sundance Sea. Uh, this is from Ron Blakey's set of uh, paleogeographic maps, if you've seen any of those. Um, but sometimes deep water sediments out here sometimes shallow water sediments. Uh, all of that created this Jurassic package of marine deposits. And here in the middle Jurassic at about 168 million years ago, the Piper and the Reardon and the Swift. And those are the three you'll hear me talk about and I'll show them in a second here. The Piper is limestones and shales. Uh, Reardon is primarily shales. It's kind of a deeper water uh, sediment. And then the swift formation is primarily sands. Uh, that's more at a time when the Sundance Sea was vacating the western U.S. and you get a lot of nearshore uh, shelf type deposits. So the marine package, Piper, Reardon, Swift, and then as the Sundance Sea vacates North America, we get the non-marine Morrison formation on top of those, and that's the one that's fairly well known for dinosaur bones in Montana, Wyoming, Colorado. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the Mesozoic rocks. This is off the west flank of the prior mountains now. I'm not going to go as, as old as the, the Madison limestones. I'm starting at the Triassic and there's that distinctive orange colored chug water formation. This is a dome structure so it sits in the core or uh, the center of this dome structure. It's kind of like an upside down bowl and I'm just going to take you up. This is kind of the middle piper dipping toward the left and down at us. Uh, that's a limestone in the middle piper. And the next shot will just move a little bit to the left. And the upper part of the piper, uh, kind of maroon and gray shales and a little bit of limestone. The reardon, the middle of those three formations I'm talking about, is a shale and occupies this valley. It's easily eroded, so um, again, kind of in the valley there. And that grades up into the swift then, which is lower part shales and in the upper part cliff forming sands. Um, all of that overlain by the, the Morrison, which isn't shown here. Part of the interesting thing about the Piper Reardon Swift, that marine sequence, is that there's an awful lot of fossils. 
So we can find crinoids, bivalves, uh, even some dinosaur tracks and bones, belemnites, ammonites, fish fossils, all kinds of things. So it's a great place to take people to look for fossils. In particular, in the lower swift, it's well known for these oyster fossils, gryphea, also belemnites, these bullet-shaped things which are the back end of a, a squid-like animal that looks like this. Um, and crinoid stems, if you have good eyes, because they're pretty small, just a few millimeters in diameter, uh, these are plant stems that are segmented, and oftentimes those segments come apart then in their little star-shaped pieces, each of these. So, on the particular day where I'm going to start my story, which is in 2010, I was out fossil hunting with my young son, who was nine years old at the time, but he gets a little credit for this story simply because he was with me and part of this uh, starfish discovery. So, um, the upper part of the swift is oftentimes, uh, well, very, very full or littered with these oyster fossils and clam fossils. So it, it sort of suggests, uh, again, shelf deposit, fairly high energy. We have all kinds of plesopods in various orientations. Uh, and that's why it, it's a little bit surprising, occasionally some vertebrate uh, fossils. But that's what's surprising about finding a starfish in, in, a, in that sort of environment. And that's the first one I saw, kind of a strange, I mean, it was a little bit surprising to find that kind of animal. Number one, you don't ever hear about starfish fossils, or I, I hadn't. Uh, n number two, I don't think I'd ever seen a starfish fossil. So I was walking along just this dip plane and, and happened to spot that guy with its five arms. I hope you can see it. And so I looked around a little more, or we did, and found another starfish fossil. And that one's a little bit more difficult to see. But if I kind of outline it there, you see these big blocky things here. Those are calcite plates called ossicles that, out, that are part of the skeleton of the starfish. So not great, but definitely one there. And not particularly big either. That's what's a quarter is about, uh, what, maybe an, maybe an inch in diameter. So these arms are an inch, inch and a half long maybe. Uh, you'll see I use various scales in this talk, and I apologize for that, but for the most part, I'm going to just tell you now that these things are pretty small, the arms being an inch, an inch and a half long, maybe up to two or something like that. Uh, so keep that in mind uh, because the scales aren't great. And, and we found a third one, which was simply a couple of arms. There's an arm, and here's an arm, and again, these things called ossicles that I'll talk about in a minute here. So back to the first one, because <clears throat> thinking it was a, a fairly rare find, I, I talked to Susan Vuk right away, and she said, yeah, that's pretty strange, and uh, we sent it off to the USGS uh, to see what they thought. And their comments came back, a rare and remarkable find, which I thought was fairly exciting. Uh, we then sent it to an invertebrate paleontologist, and the comment was, yeah, a poorly preserved starfish, and it didn't sound very exciting. So um, I thought, well, two things. How rare are they? And secondly, if there are a couple, I think there must be more. So I kind of became, it kind of became uh, a place I would visit once in a while to see what I could find in addition to these first few. So let me go back to why these are so rare and just talk a little bit about starfish biology. Um, my biology is not particularly strong. I didn't really like biology. So I'm going to start where I had to start, which is here's the dorsal side or aboral side. And the anus is in the middle. The madrepore right there is the opening into the water vascular system of starfish. Uh, on the ventral side or the underside, also called the oral side, uh, the mouth is in the center of the animal. And these long furrows down each arm, I'm sure people have picked up a starfish and seen those things. That's called the ambulacral groove. So other than that, though, they're really soft-bodied creatures and kind of hollow and, you know, just a big cavity. So let's look at an arm, because what I want to focus on is what are the hard parts or what's the endoskeleton of these things. 
And there are these things I've already mentioned called ossicles, calcareous platelets that are held together by soft tissues. So I'm going to really focus on two styles of ossicles here that you'll hear me talk about. One are the marginals. There's a couple different kinds of marginals there, and I'm not going to worry about the supra versus infra, but the marginals. And then this one along the ambulacral groove, those are the ambulacral ossicles between which the tube feet of the starfish stick out and, and they use those to move and also uh, to prey on shellfish and other things. So if we look internally to a starfish, there's the ambulacral groove and ambulacral ossicles. They're a little, sort of zipper, looks like a zipper, but they're actually uh, uh, a little bit uh, vaulted, so it's kind of like an A-frame thing uh, all along each of the arms. Uh, again, the tube feet stick out between those for mobility and predation. And one of the things I'm going to point out now, just because as we look at the fossils, you'll note some similarities, I think. Uh, this is kind of the common starfish. And the juncture of its arms are really angular. It's kind of like your fingers. They grow together. And as the animal, as the central disc grows, that moves outward and it stays kind of just a sharp angle. And then there's other kinds of starfish, like this guy that have more of a rounded interbrachial angle. And notice the marginals on this guy, they're, they're really hard to see, but these are very pronounced. You can see those ossicles just under the, the uh, outer skin of the animal. So the problem with starfish is when they die, they just become kind of mush. Uh, they collapse, they become misshapen like this guy here. And the ossicles, within a matter of a, a couple of days, uh, the soft tissues that held them together is gone and they will become disarticulated by current action and wave action and scavengers and even if they make it onto the surface of the sediment, uh, bioturbation and other things. So within a couple of days they'll just turn into a pile of sand essentially. Uh, the other thing about starfish is they tend to favor hard substrates, not soft sediment and soft sediment is really much better for preserving fossils. So just a couple things about why they are so rare. Um, but even from ossicles, even if they are scattered, uh, they can be reconstructed. Starfish can be reconstructed from the ossicles just the way people do with dinosaur bones and reconstructing dinosaur skeletons. Uh, I'm not sure that's a job I would want, but you know, a lot of the early work on starfish, particularly in the UK, was focused on describing the shape and size of those ossicles. Okay, so now the other part of this is, okay, so they're rare. How rare? Let's look at the fossil record and see how many have been described for uh, our age rocks. There's plenty of Paleozoic starfish in the literature, but there was a large extinction event at the end of the Paleozoic and radiation really began again in the Mesozoic about 250 million years ago. And that line of starfish still exists today. So from the early Mesozoic all the way to today, that line of starfish are still alive. Uh, they can be related back. So when you look at Mesozoic starfish in the literature, there really wasn't very much that I could find. And I'm going to draw the distinction here right away uh, between Ophiuroids, the brittle stars, and that's, these are brittle stars shown here, they have a smaller central disc and kind of these long whip-like arms that are very flexible. Uh, so there's lots of Ophiuroids from the Mesozoic and a few asteroids, the typical five-armed guy like this. Uh, lots of those, or a few of those from Europe, but there really wasn't much from North America as I started digging into the literature. There's only a handful of asteroids from North America. There were a couple in the tri Triassic, uh, five or six in the Jurassic. So that's, I was in the Swift Formation, which is Jurassic age, so that's really what I was looking for. How many are from the Jurassic in North America? Not very many. And a few more have been described in the Cretaceous. So it turns out they are quite rare, at least for North America. Okay, this is just the listing. I'll let you look at it. There's only one or two things I want to point out, but this was it for Jurassic starfish. 
A couple that are just drawings in some of the early stuff, a particular genus called Aster, Astreus. And then what I could find was just a, a few samples here. All of, if you notice, were found near us, Wyoming, Utah, Wyoming, Wyoming. And we'll cross that guy off because he's actually a little bit older than, than the formation I'm dealing with. But the other three are all from the Sundance in Wyoming, which is equivalent to the Swift in Montana. So here was one that was directly same age. Redwater shale is part of the Sundance, same age, same age. All of those described as eocanasters as the genus. Um, so that was at least something I could look at as a comparison. And this is a, these are two of those, the 1943 ventral view of this starfish. And again, it's only, that's an inch. So the whole thing is only an inch and a half in diameter. I'm saying this for John's benefit because he's given me grief about these small starfish fossils. <laughs> uh, the other one, the more recent one, same thing. It's about an inch and a half in diameter. And when I looked at these, I kind of got depressed again because look how fantastic some of these specimens are and how much you can see compared to what I saw. And there's a big difference. So, you know, at a minimum, I thought, well, maybe Eocanaster is, is one of those that might be uh, there at the prior mountain site. So all of that, you know, researching the literature led, led me to uh, Daniel Blake at the University of Illinois uh, in 2012. So this is two years into it. I've been looking at these things for a couple years, looking for more. Uh, so I contacted Daniel Blake, sent him some pictures, and said, what do you think? Um, and, and I'm going to try to summarize a few of his comments, not the least of which was his end result was, I'm a professor emeritus, we're moving departments, there's not going to be room for me, I don't want to take any new projects on, I'm sending all these other starfish fossils back of people that, you know, have sent them to me. So uh, it didn't sound like he was in any position to take on a project. Uh, but he did say a couple interesting things, that there may be more than one species there, and he, had, he said, you know, do what you can to document the site. It's always good to document the site, have it in the literature. But, but this was kind of his overriding uh, mentality on the thing. I don't want to be too encouraging because they're very, very difficult fossils to work with. And the other thing about that was I realized, looking at the literature, that, you know, he's a world expert or the world expert on asteroids. He's getting stuff sent to him from all over the world, probably, stuff that looks like this you know, with that kind of incredible detail to it. So again, the hopelessness set in. So for several years, this kind of became a hobby again. I, I really wanted to search for that super, uh, super spectacular uh, uh, specimen. So now I'll talk a little bit more about showing you what I found. This is a dip slope of the top, near the top of the Swift. And it's, I'm, uh, I apologize, it's really hard to see the yellow numbers there, I think, but uh, over the course of four years, I found about 20, this was maybe, I, I'd make maybe two trips out during the summer and look, or maybe three. Almost every time I went out, I could find something new. So I found about 20 different specimens, and, you know, over the course of years, I lost some. I couldn't find them for two years, and then I'd find them again, things like that. So finally, I did document the site and put little flags on each of these bedding faces that had starfish in them. Um, with the little flags. And then for each of those faces, same thing. I would document where are each of the specimens. So I have S1, where this is site three. So three, one, three, two, three, three was there, three, four was there. So I could go back out there and find each one. And now I'm going to show you what some of those look like. Hopefully they'll show up OK. So there are some that I thought were good. You know, at least I see an arm and an arm and an arm. I hope you can see it. Uh, to me, that was good. Other arms, and I want you to look now at just a, a couple things. Uh, compare and contrast, like this guy, with really narrow ambulacral ossicles along that arm, with something like this guy, which has those big blocky marginals and not a very sharp angle between the arms. So already you can see some differences in some of these things. Um, Sometimes pretty decent long arms. This guy's about two and a half inches long. Sometimes very tiny arms. 
there's a penny for comparison. That's about a centimeter long. Sometimes I could, you know, you look at, I got back to the office and was looking at this, and then I'd see, hey, what's that? And, and uh, completely miss it out in the field. So, so some were, some were sort of big, but relative, I mean, most of them were pretty small. Then there's the bad ones. There's some stuff here that looks like an arm in here, and also there's some material down in here that looks like an arm. There's a jackknife for a scale. So yeah, these are pretty small. More bad. At least it's got some arms, but they're really, really weathered, uh, so not such a good specimen. Notice all the bivalve material around, too. There's all kinds of other stuff in this rock mixed in. Uh, there's another bad. We kind of have a central disc with an arm and an arm and an arm out here, and then some other stuff out here. And then there's the really ugly stuff. There's, you know, if you can see, once your eye gets trained to what these ossicles look like, you can start to spot this stuff and this stuff and this stuff. Sometimes just a pile of ossicles with no shape at all. So there's, there were some sort of good ones and plenty of bad ones. By the way, just, I, I saw this the other day. In case anybody wanna see, wants to see what one of those little crinoid starfish look like, there's one right there in the rock. Okay, so that gives you a flavor of what they looked like. That's not all of them, but you know, again, I'm not a paleontologist, but it did look like multiple species might be present. This looks like the eocanaster with kind of a triangular shape arm and these big blocky marginal ossicles. This other style, not such blocky marginals, and these very narrow ambulacral ossicles going down the length of the arm. So I, I do want to give a little credit to Gary Thompson, who's an ex-Rocky professor, because he kind of he went out in the field with me a couple times, and he sort of convinced me that, you know, you don't need to find a perfect specimen to, to get somebody to work on it. There's actually an awful lot of information here. And so he was, you know, I, kept, I guess he kept propping up my spirits a little bit when I, I couldn't find that perfect specimen. But whoop. So ultimately convincing me that, you know, it's the collection that might be worthwhile here. How are we doing on time? Okay, good. So I kept after it. Again, this started in 2010, went up through 2014, 2015. Uh, every so often I'd send Dan Blake a couple more pictures, uh, you know, but uh, kind of the same. I don't want to be too encouraging. These are difficult kind of thing. Um, finally, I took that entire packet of documentation with all the pictures and uh, I went to the BLM and 2014 because it was on BLM land and I thought, you know, I, I need to let somebody know that these things are out there. Uh, maybe, they, maybe their paleontologist knows somebody else who could work on these or, you know, that kind of thing. So um, I took that BLM, talked it through with them. Uh, I just, I wanted to make sure that the site was somehow protected at least. Um, well, it turns out that you know, I told him about Dan Blake and, you know, that I'd talked to him, but it, Greg Liggett at the BLM, their paleontologist, contacted Dan again. And maybe that was the extra little push Dan Blake needed, uh, partly because now BLM was involved and it made it easy for collection, maybe partly because it was just another voice. But in 2015, Dan Blake and a colleague of his uh, from Rock Valley College, Tom Ginsberg, came out. That was... 2015 in June to collect uh, the fossils. So finally the persistence paid off and the hobby kind of turned into a scientific discovery. So I was excited by that. What I wasn't very excited about was that it happened to be the only week that I was scheduled for a vacation that I could not miss. So here these guys were finally coming out after five years and I wasn't going to be around. So uh, that was really disappointing. Um, I was happy to know that, this is Dan Blake, by the way, when he was out, uh, pictures by BLM, sweeping off a couple of these faces and marking some of the specimens. Um, a couple of the comments these guys made, and I, I don't really, you know, you don't think about these kinds of things, but uh, he said he was, 
really elated and uh, sort of overwhelmed because they can spend their entire life and maybe find one or two in the field. And they walk out here and here they are all over the place. So, I mean, that was gratifying to hear. At least it wasn't a waste of their time. They were excited by it. I, uh, I came back from vacation just in time because I did get to spend a half day out there with these guys uh, at the end of their trip. They had used rock saws and the BLM supervision and all that kind of thing and, and removed a whole bunch of stuff. They found more than what I had discovered, so um, they had a whole bunch of stuff um, put together. But when I went out there, they, I, I took my sheet and said, yeah, yeah, it looks like they took all these. But they had missed a couple uh, that I thought had quite a bit of detail in. So this particular day, we, we ran back into Bridger and bought a couple chisels and came back out and started hammering away at this. This is Tom Ginsburg here. Uh, he and I worked on that guy for an hour and a half, I think. And there's, there's Dan Blake and uh, yours truly out in the field. <laughs> Uh, with one of the specimens we, we chiseled out. And, you know, it really was an interesting day for me because I'd looked at these things for five years and had all kinds of questions in, in, in my head. And so to, to get to spend a half day with a couple of world experts was, uh, was pretty neat. The only, you know, it was a little bit frustrating because they kept saying things like porin, oh, there's the asterid and the porinid and these other things, and I had no idea what they were talking about. So uh, I had to go do some more studying. So, all told, uh, they shipped four boxes of stuff back to Illinois for study. And I, I, and I don't know, again, I don't know how many more they have. I, I've kind of pieced it together. I think we're close to 30 specimens, maybe. Um, and Dan started working on those in August or something, July, August kind of time frame. And his style of, again, he's, he's the kind of guy who, he's a world expert. He, he looks at morphology, the shape of these animals. He looks at taxonomy. How do I classify them? What kind of starfish are they? And he does that by looking whoop, at these ossicles again. And I, you know, I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of his black and whites and what each of these little arrows mean because it's, it's I think, way beyond what you, what you might find interesting. But, you know, some things about the marginal ossicles, but then there's also these tiny little guys here, these little dorsal. Uh, platelets that are still preserved on the inside of that guy. And he looks at, you know, gaps in between these guys and the difference in the ambulacral ossicles of this guy versus the one that had those really narrow ones. Uh, but you can see these calcite platelets are, are very leached and worn. They should be nicely rounded, but they're all beat up. And so in part, he was right. These are tough fossils to work with. And the comment about poorly preserved asteroids, that was partly right, too. <clears throat> so Dan, again, looks at morphology, taxonomy, tries to classify these things. And then he carries that into looking at life habits. What is this, you know, now that I know what it is, what does it mean? And uh, he's also heavily involved in, you know, reconstructing the evolution from the Mesozoic up to the present of the asteroids. So the whole phylogenetic, phylogenic tree for these things. Uh, I wanted to show this guy because a couple things. This is, now that I know a little more about the asterids and porinids, this is the guy with the, the finger-like arms that grow together. That's an asterid for the uh, family, is asterid. And it's the one that has these uh, kind of very narrow ambulacral ossicles. And that's, that's important because from an evolutionary point of view, uh, that's more tube feet per unit length on these arms. And so they have really flexible arms. And they're the ones that you know, learned how to pry open the bivalve, bivalves to eat. And in fact, for those who don't know, they, they kind of pry open the bivalves with their arms wrapped around it. And then they evert their stomachs into the bivalve to dissolve it. And you know, it's kind of gruesome. But so anyway. Uh, Dan looks at the life habits evolution, and in fact, this was the first species that I found, the one that had the rock hammer by it, and he's pointing out here that that's a, a bivalve shell within the animal. So this one actually ingested some sort of bivalve, and, and it's stuck in there. So all in all, what did we learn? Well, let me start. This is their words. For Jurassic starfish, this is the most important site, faunal site in North America, and there's only one other in the world 
that has this kind of diversity, and that's in Switzerland. At least four species there. One is a new species. Uh, one of the others they're having a little trouble figuring out because it's got no known living uh, relative. So they call it the pencil arm guy. Uh, but anyway, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that maybe more in a minute. So Jurassic specimens that used to have only five or six in North America, now we're up to 30 some. And, and we'll, that will almost certainly add to their notion of the evolutionary models and how that all fits together. And then the last point that I'll, I'll talk about just briefly, but maybe not much. Uh, they were all dorsal side up and in approximate living configure or orientation. So what does that mean f in terms of burial and preservation? From a, from a geology point of view, that's, that, you know, that's the one you go kind of scratch your head and think about a little bit. So this is the new species of asterid family asterid, and this is the holotype. Again, those arms are only a, a little over a centimeter, maybe. Uh, that's the holotype, which means it is the go-by for this species. And uh, I, Dan submitted his manuscript to the Journal of Paleontology for this stuff, and I was uh, honored and somewhat humbled by the fact that he called this a Talipogaster gundersoni. <laughs> so, so uh, just to tie it up in holotypes, paratypes, other things, and that's not important really. What's important, I think, is that the entire collection went to the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, uh, who had zero. Now they have 20 or more specimen of starfish. And as I've been talking about here, there is an asterid, the new species, uh, a holotype and several paratypes. And then there's astropectinid, that's the Eocanaster guy with the big broad marginals and that kind of thing. Uh, Goni asteroids, and then the undetermined asteroid. Unfortunately, you know, some of these, like the Goni asteroid, that's only to the family level, no genus or species, simply because those ossicles are weathered enough that he can't quite tell where it belongs. And the same with this guy. All he's able to say is it's an asteroid, but I can't carry it any further. There, there weren't enough of them and there, there weren't enough uh, in good shape to, to really go beyond that. Uh, and a couple to Montana Tech Mineral Museum. So thank you to John Medish, and also Dan Blake and Tom Ginsberg, and the guys at the Field Museum in Chicago. We did manage to get a couple in there right over there. Uh, yeah, they're, uh, they look, eh, the picture's not great, but it's probably better than the specimen. You see it's got four arms. This is one of those new species of asteroids. That guy and this guy which is currently in two pieces because of this fracture but that's a goni asteroid. So at least we got a couple back because they are from Montana. I think it's important that we we have a couple back in Montana. Okay the remaining question is simply uh, how did they come to be here in this small little area? I couldn't find, I mean that bedding plane went a long way, but all I could find is in that little 200 square meter area that you saw in that first picture of the site. So how did they be, come to be preserved there? Uh, we know these are rare, and I think preservation is particularly rare because these are coarse grain sediments, medium to coarse grain sediments, and you might argue in a high energy environment with all those bivalve shells. So somewhere on the shelf. Again, this is what that rock looks like. This is maybe, these are more dense than most places. Some of the starfish you saw, there were a few bivalves here and there, not, not quite like this, which is almost a fossil hash, but definitely shell lag there somewhere, and that would seem to indicate some higher energy environment. Uh, and I don't know the answer, uh, but but I think it does bring up a couple things. Uh, these have been interpreted as storm deposits, both filling channels, and then a, and then a, a reinterpretation of these coconoid beds or these shell beds was that they were kind of lags in between giant sand waves in the Sundance Sea. So I'm going to go with that and say, okay, fine. Uh, maybe these were giant sand waves built up in a shallow Sundance Sea. Maybe there's some shell lag in the bottom. I'm not sure what the starfish were doing there. One thing is pretty clear, if they're all dorsal side up, they weren't part of some storm deposit and tossed around. So the shells were there, 
the starfish come in, and I don't know if they're feeding, you know, maybe you could argue that based on what you saw in the one with a shell in it, but whatever the reason, the other half of the story is uh, they were apparently buried alive then, all in living orientations, by some large influx of sediment that was probably not terribly violent, or again, they would have been churned up. So here they sit. I'm thinking, you know, sheets of sand coming off these sand waves, which they say could be up to 10 meters tall. So maybe you get big sand piles shifting off those waves into this low spot. Uh, I really don't know, but uh, it's interesting to think about anyway. Uh, and the other part of it is the sediments then stayed totally undisturbed after burial. They weren't reworked or they'd be churned up. No bioturbation, that would have messed things up. So whatever happened, it was you know, maybe near the end of the Sundance Sea's existence and away it went and left this stuff just piled on these guys. This is that bedding plane going to the north now where I, I didn't find anything here, but I was interested because this is the package that overlies it. So that's maybe part of the sediment that holds the key, these thin bedded sands that really don't have any fossils and don't look like they're bioturbated. So maybe they are some sort of sheet sand that piled onto this surface. So a couple parting thoughts, I guess. Uh, one is if you find something strange, I think it's good in today's world, you can ask an expert, you can take a picture and, uh, and find out if anybody knows what it is. And the second thing I learned is just because it doesn't look good doesn't mean it isn't good. In this case, it was the entire collection that really held the value for, for knowledge, and that's what mattered. So what's next for me? Well, you know, no doubt I will continue to look at starfish or look for starfish. But my son and I were out a couple years ago, and high above the Missouri River, up in the banks in the Judith River Formation, found this. So the BLM tells me they're going to go after this one this summer. And this is uh, my son after that find as we kind of enjoyed the sunset above the Missouri River. So acknowledgments, I, I, you know, I can't say enough about how much I appreciate and respect Dan Blake and Tom Ginsburg. They were fabulous guys. And uh, it was just great to see these actually have something done with them and go someplace. So. Greg Leggett, the uh, paleontologist at BLM, for helping to facilitate the collection of these. And Gary Thompson, who helped in the field an awful lot. And Clay Schwartz helped in the field an awful lot. And then I have a, uh, in case anybody's interested to, to learn more about this stuff, I did a paper that's published with the Bureau, just a short one on where they, or, you know, the occurrence. But Blake and Ginsburg will have their article come out in the Journal of Paleontology, I'm sure, within the next couple of months. Uh, two other things I'll mention. One thing that was really interesting, uh, really fascinating, Chris Ma is one of Dan Blake's students who works with uh, living starfish and all echinoderms, actually. He's got this echino blog. It's really fascinating to read about these things. Uh, um, so anyway, if you're interested, uh, you might look that up. And uh, if you want to learn any more about the Priors, uh, there's a good Priors Coalition website out there as well. So if you look up that, uh, you, you'll, you can learn more about the Prior Mountains, the stuff I had up front. And that's all I have. Thank you for your time. Oh, unless, unless, and you might want to go look at the starfish fossils. Hopefully you're not too disappointed now when you go over there. Uh, questions or any comments? Yes. Yeah. You go ahead. I'm curious if you had the there were big sand waves across the sea. Yeah. Then wouldn't you have the crossbeds? Yeah, and and there are some crossbeds in that upper swift whole package. There's crossbeds, and that's part of the interpretation that you get you get big crossbeds. On, on some of those. They actually, their model is big sand waves, you know, big high things, and then kind of ripples that obliquely cross that too. So you get sand movement. And, you know, I was at, that's about all I could understand out of the paper. But anyway, these migrating sand ripples across this stuff. But yeah, there are cross beds, there are ripple marks. I, I have a lot of pictures of them, but I didn't show any of them. But 
Yeah. Does that help answer or okay? Yeah. So these starfish were all basically on the surface between the rock and the air right now, right? It, right now. Right now they were right now they're gone. They're Chicago and here. Yeah. They were on the surface between the rock and the air. Yes. Um, they were presumably underwater and under mud or something at some point. They are the absolute only layer that has starfish in it. Or if you, um, you said there wasn't any fossils in what come down on top of them, but I was wondering if there's any suspicion that if you dug deeper or drill deeper or something, I'm not, and, you know, in that area, would you find more layers, which happen to be surfaces that starfish crawled around on? Because uh -huh. at some point, presumably, the stuff that was on top of that hadn't yeah. been carried away yet. It, it, it had to, it, it had this wonderful coincidence of what was there had to be cleaned off so that then you could see it. It goes down to exactly this layer that has the starfish sitting on it. Yeah. And there's no more buried starfish or anything like that. No, there certainly could be. Uh, these beds repeat, these right. shell beds and, right. and right. other beds. And what I found was a bedding plane that I could find them. and and they look like they're all on one bedding plane. In reality, some versions of these starfish actually enjoy soft sediment and bury themselves a little bit in the soft sediment. Mm -hmm. So they could be, you know, somewhere a, 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 an inch down or mm -hmm. other things. And I think some of them they found probably, I think they pried up some slabs and did find some. But even, even more than that, yes, you could find them, you know, five feet down. If the conditions were right, you could find them preserved somewhere, right? Yeah, can you? Did they use plaster or anything to keep them intact when we're trying to get them out? Or? Well, again, I, I didn't get to be there the day they, the, the days, the five or so days that they took most of them out. I think because they had rock saws, they cut slabs like you can see over there. Uh, the day we worked on it, no, you, if a, the fossil's here, we were chiseling way out here to make sure we didn't crack anything. And, you know, I don't know. They may have destroyed some, I really don't know, again, not being there. So, but they didn't use plaster or any of that kind of thing. Well, yeah, parts of the swift right there are really hard, dense rock, but an awful lot of it is this kind of hummock, you know, you could maybe kind of see it. There's so much rubble around. They're kind of hummocky and kind of punky rock. So. You know, in some spots you could tap on it, it almost sounded hollow underneath. So depending on which face you were working on, it might be easier or it might be difficult. The one we were chiseling out was kind of uh, an inner, intermediate to those. So yeah, it's not, they're not all solid. It's weathering and crumbling and, you know. Did they do anything with the other fossils to see if those were all known like oysters or what kind of? Uh, no. Uh, Tom Ginsburg is a in particular is a, a, a crinoid guy, so he, he was interested to see whether, you know, you have the stem parts all over, so he was interested to you know, seeing if he could find some crino, complete crinoids, and, you know, he's kind of sure they must be out there somewhere, but uh, other than that, no, they didn't look at the other things. Dick. Yeah. These guys were kind of a muddy set. Well, it's actually pretty sandy. It's, it's kind of a medium grain calcareous and glauconitic sand with all kinds of shells and other materials scattered in it. Do present-day starfish live in that environment? Do I have like seeing a bit, like living under the salt or something? But maybe I have to look in the right place. Well, now that I know a little bit about starfish, the answer is that the astropectinids, uh, the eocanaster being one of those, they, they do prefer soft sediments, and they, uh, they have those marginal blocky ossicles just like another one, but part of what they also have is some sort of mechanism to spit out debris and be able to get air and water in, and so they don't mind settling in muds and sands. But otherwise, yeah, I agree with you. You know, the asteroids in particular, I think you see them always on rocks or, you know, hard surfaces. 
other, yeah. Do those starfish resemble any of today's existing starfish? Yeah, part of the, part of why I bring up Chris Ma and part of this whole idea that you can re reconstruct the evolution is because the present day starfish really have evolved all the way from that radiation in the Mesozoic. So these all, all of today's starfish are descendants really from the Jurassic proliferation of starfish. I'm wondering, like, like I'm told sharks haven't changed mm. much. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's beyond me to probably even comment on it. I read something about a lot of the a lot of the early evolution that happened in the first sixty million years in the Jurassic, but I don't really know what that means. So, how much have they evolved since? I don't know. Yeah. Well. And actually, I guess I've read more than once that these are not that different from the Jurassic. So, I mean, read in between the lines on that, I guess, to some extent. The, 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 I mean, the present day ones are not that much different from Jurassic. Yes? Uh, is there anything postulated, but these specimens have been found from what they might have uh, evolved from what was left over? Uh, no, I really don't know anything about that, I guess. Yeah, there, there had to be some that survived the Paleozoic extinction and, yeah, and, and reformed in, in the Triassic, Jurassic. Oh, in the Paleozoic? Yeah. Okay. No, if I if I uh, insinuated that, I didn't mean to. There, there were definitely the five-arm asteroids in the Paleozoic as well. Hmm. Well, if anybody's looked at it, it's probably been Dan Blake. So. I, Any other questions? Oh, no. We'll have to discuss that offline. <laughs> okay, thank you.